to Cultural Organizing, a live streamed conversation brought to you by the American Friends Service Committee. I'm Alexis Moore, Media Director for AFSC. Art has the power to reach and move people beyond what traditional education and organizing can do. Activists around the world are using art to challenge war, racism, and militarism in their communities. In recent years, a growing number of individuals and organizations have been using the term cultural organizing to describe this practice at the intersection of art, cultural work, and social change. What cultural organizing looks like and varies from place to place, but it generally includes these elements, cultural strategy, community arts, and cultural integration in community organizing work. Today we'll discuss how three different cultural organizers with AFSC are using these strategies in their communities in California, Louisiana, and Indiana to challenge militarism. Let me introduce Minerva Mendoza, a program associate for AFSC's Pan Valley program in Fresno, California, which created the Tamajavi Festival. Tabitha Mustafa is a program associate for AFSC's New Orleans Peace by Peace program. Hi, Tabitha. And Erin Polly is program coordinator for AFSC's Indiana Peace Building Program. Hi, Erin. Erin. Hi, Alexis. Let's start with you, Minerva. Minerva Tamajavi is built on the idea of a community building process in which people share cultural traditions and artistic expression with one another to build stronger, more active communities. Can you tell us some more about the origins of Tamajavi and how the artistic process serves as a form of cultural organizing? Hi, Alexis. Yes. So the artistic process serves as a community organizing because it allows the communities to claim their identities and come into terms of who they are. As you know, language, food, music, poetry, and art are part of their identities and is embedded in their everyday life. With self-identification also comes community pride, which we know is very important in order for these communities to be more active. Um, the artistic process serves as a learning, uh, also a learning process of their communities. Here in the Central Valley, we have a very um, diverse ethnic communities living together, and by providing these spaces um, for artistic process, they get to know each other. They learn of who they are, where they come from, what's their journey. Um, this is when we begin to see more. This is when they begin to see more than the differences, uh, the commonalities. Um, and also, this leads to dialogue about pressing issues. I often hear um, the fellows share about, like, you know, the spices, for example, that they use it in the same way for the same dish, uh, that they have very similar, if not the same, instruments, um, the rituals that they have for when they, the women give birth or get married are, are similar. Um, and But also, they share the things that are the struggles for being an immigrant to a country that sometimes is not very welcoming. Um, they share the journey of coming to, the, to this country either by war, by poverty, or in many cases both. Um, uh, they share how marginalized and oppressed their communities have been um, even in their countries of origin. And this artistic process becomes a healing process for many of them. Excellent. Thank you, Minerva. Um, 
If you're joining our conversation, please go in the chat box with your comments or questions or send to questions at afsc.org. Uh, Tabitha, let's talk about New Orleans as a community organizer with AFSC's Peace by Peace program in New Orleans. And as a native New Orleanian, I'm sure you have thoughts about why and how cultural work plays a significant role in community campaigns. Can you tell us some more about the importance of integrating cultural elements in community campaigns? Sure, so I think uh, with without language and without culture, without land, people tend to lose their identity. So in New Orleans, we try to be mindful of that fact. Um, so when we think about the impact that Katrina has had um, with a lot of New Orleanians losing their homes or losing land, um, that plays a significant role as well as certain uh, elements of culture and dialect. So culturally in New Orleans there are Mardi Gras parades which I think everyone is quite familiar with. In New Orleans we do what's called the Pieces Power Parade and in doing the Pieces Power Parade we uh, we try to be mindful of the the impact that having a parade has because for a lot of Black New Orleanians they remember the heritage of parading and it's actually a very white and racist um, heritage. So New Orleanians of African descent have tended to do second lines instead. So in doing second lines, New Orleanians um, have the, the opportunity to have brass bands. So when we do our pieces power parade, we make sure to incorporate brass bands so that we have those elements of culture in there that are so um, reminiscent to, to second lines and to things that people in New Orleans find important. Um, the same thing goes for our Designing Our Freedom series. The young people in there um, use hip hop, rap, spoken word, uh, and they wear hoodies and, and things that have, have come to uh, mark black people and people of color um, in a negative way and turn them around into pieces of art that represent um, nonviolence and the ability to, to transform conflict and using culture um, for that purpose. And I would say the, the last thing that readily comes to mind would be in our um, Katrina X short documentary. The young people had an opportunity to participate in that and so in participating in, in that uh, filmmaking process, one of the filmmakers decided that they would use a song called Magnolia Clap and the Magnolia Clap is for people who are from the Magnolia Projects and none of our young people are. Um, so they were like, you have to take that out. Yeah, there's no way that we would be okay with leaving this in there. Um, so we had to heed what they were saying and, and we took that out of the film and used a song that they felt was more appropriate. So just little, the little things make the difference. Aaron, um can you describe a little bit about the activities and conversations that happened as a result of both boycott, the art of economic activism, and the humanize, not militarize, which is the newest traveling, newest exhibit. traveling exhibit? Sure. Uh, the boycott exhibit is a beautiful collection of posters that we have from historical and contemporary boycott movements over the past 60 years or so. And what I love about this exhibit is that it shows how economic activism has been used in nonviolent as a nonviolent tactic in so many movements for social change. Uh, there are posters from the civil rights movement to the farm workers rights movement into the present day boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement to bring change in Israel and Palestine. When we've used the exhibit here in Indiana, we've displayed it on college campuses and we're able to engage the students in so many different uh, conversations. We can talk about nonviolence and movement building, the relevancy of economic activism to challenge injustices, and of course it always leads to a deeper dialogue about the movements that are featured in the exhibit. Uh, recently we displayed the exhibit on the campus of the University of Indianapolis as the students there are preparing for a vote uh, on a historic resolution to call for divestment from corporations complicit in the oppression of Palestinian people. 
So the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter displayed the exhibit in their student center for a week. Uh, they engaged various different student groups and uh, talked about the various movements and how they were all interconnected and really used it as a way to inspire the students who would be participating in that vote to etch out their own contribution in this deep history of economic activism by voting for the college to divest. The Humanize Not Militarize exhibit has had a similar effect. These posters are made by artists from across the U.S and deal with the ways in which our society has become increasingly more militarized on our borders and our schools and our law enforcement agencies. So here in Indianapolis, we've displayed them on college campuses and in community spaces. And because the images are dealing with so many intricacies of militarism and policing, viewers are able to make the connections across the struggles from Ferguson to Gaza. Uh, we've also used the exhibit and the accompanying film festival, also called Humanize Not Militarize, as a way to explore alternatives to militarism and violence. So every time we display the exhibit, we ask viewers to make their own po posters in response. And overwhelmingly, these posters are pushing back on this narrative that violence is the only way. We see people making images of things that really make them feel safe and secure, like community gardens growing fresh food for people in their neighborhood, or alternative energy models that would protect our environment. So as a result of displaying the exhibit in our community, AFSE has developed relationships with schools and youth programs to continue the conversation into our film festival, and we have several groups locally who are making videos exploring these various issues. That's great. That's uh, great. We, uh, we, we have a question. Um, the exhibit sounds interesting. Can you tell us more about how other people can bring it to their communities? Is there a cost? Erin? Sure, yeah. Uh, both exhibits, uh, the Boycott exhibit, Boycott the Art of Economic Activism, and the Humanize Not Militarize exhibit are touring around the country, and uh, we do our best to uh, keep the costs very low. Um, because they're posters, they're easy to transport. In fact, you know, you can even print them yourselves and display them up. Uh, in a community space, but you can find out more information on the AFSC website on how to bring it to your community. That's great. Um, the website is afsc.org. You can also send any of your questions or comments in the chat box or to questions at afsc.org. I'm going to go back to Minerva for a minute because uh, I find it interesting that young people are reclaiming pieces of their image, for want of a better word. Can you talk a little bit about how that may be happening with the young people involved in your work? Yes. So we, what we have found out is the, a lot of the um, immigrant children, what we would call the 1.5 generation, um, are finding themselves um, growing up in this country and they have a better sense of their identities, of their cultures, because they, many of them, they, they, they grew up in Mexico and at a later age came to this country. Um, but we also have seen that the second generation of uh, immigrants are the ones that are struggling with trying to see who they are and once they're in this country trying to assimilate into the main, mainstream culture, but then they're kind of um, stuck there because they're not part of the mainstream culture, but they're also not, um, for example, Hmong enough. Um, and this is when they kind of start in this journey of trying to find out, well, where do I come from, right? What is my history? What are my traditions? What is it? Where do I come from? What are the histories of colonization? Um, and this is where they start looking for their identity and exploring through the arts and music, poetry. That's wonderful. Um, interesting to know, too. Um, Tabitha, let's talk a little bit more about how culture and art infuses everything around the young people, especially in New Orleans. There's a 
there's an argument to be made that New Orleans is the actual creative capital of jazz and other forms of music. How do the young people respond to having this history? I think the young folks are very much in tune with that. Um, I would agree with you that New Orleans is definitely the cultural capital of the U.S., but it, I mean it's a cultural uh, mecca in the world. Um, and so I think that being born into that kind of breeds a, a sense of uh, culture, and musical, musical talent, things like that are, are bred into you. Um, so the young folks here really take that to heart. Um, just the other day in the garden, they started singing with some of the kids in the neighborhood who came through. So literally anything you could think of, um, they bring culture into it. They bring art into it. They you know, want to paint the sides of, of the houses and the buildings. And um, using that as a way to organize the community and to, to tell them about our struggle and to, to take that and move it to the next level um, using all of the, the tools and talents that they have at hand. That's awesome. Uh, Minerva, a question for you. You are working with so many different immigrant groups. How do you build trust among people as they work together in your program? Can you give any examples? Sure. So um, we, as part of our work, we integrate what we call um, residential gatherings, and we basically um, go out of the city to any place outside, and my kind of in the mountains to be in tune with nature. And these are two and a half day gatherings where we bring the people that we're working with, um, like you said, with different immigrant groups. Um, and um, we do a lot of storytelling, story circle, um, kind of share uh, our culture. We ask them to bring an item that is traditional in their community um, and share the story behind it. And slowly they start, like I shared earlier, start seeing the common things, right? And that starts building trust and they start just sharing. Um, it's interesting because uh, in the last cohort of the fellowship program that we are currently working with, um, there was a lady from, a Mixteco lady, and there was also a lady from, um, she is Punjabi. And despite the language difference, they always were able to communicate somehow, and they were, they were really connected, and trust was really built there. I imagine that was a great conversation and I also imagine that food plays a large part in helping people appreciate each other's community and community Correct. traditions. Correct. Music, food always brings people together. Yeah, and to that end, uh, let me ask Erin, what kinds of activities around the food and music have you seen or experienced starting from your own personal experience when you were first involved as a volunteer at AFSC? Oh sure, yeah. Um, well I, I did get my start at AFSC as a volunteer on a cultural project. Uh, the Eyes Wide Open exhibit which was sort of at the height of the Iraq War I started out as a volunteer with AFSC in Chicago on the creation of that exhibit. And it was really a, a very important uh, experience for me because as a volunteer I was given so many responsibilities and really valued and I felt like I was really being cultivated into um, this movement. And so, uh, so I think, you know, when we're doing this kind of cultural work and we're using art and food and music and culture as a way to uh, you know, change people's hearts and minds about social justice movements. I think we also, you know, have to think about how we're cultivating the next generation of activists and giving people a real role to play that's significant and, and engaging people with various skill sets and diverse backgrounds. Yes, it's interesting that diversity, which has become a flashpoint in some communities, has been seen as a strength 
at AFSC. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask all three of you this question, but I'd like to start with Aaron again. Why do you think arts and culture are such an important part of social change work? Uh, yes, let's start with you, Aaron. Sure. Um, I think you know some of the issues that we at the American Friends Service Committee are talking about with peace and nonviolence. Um, th these are very huge topics that are sometimes really hard to get conversations started on. So I think um, when we can use art particularly as a way to open up these conversations uh, and also using some of these art exhibits that AFSC has toured over the years, we're able to get into communities and engage with diverse audiences um, just because of, of the fact that we have this display that we can take maybe on a you know, art walk, on a first Friday tour or something like that. Um, but I think also, uh, you know, more than anything, artists and cultural workers have oftentimes been the ones to shape public sentiment. And so when we are engaging artists and cultural workers in social change work, uh, where we are really shaping the way that society is thinking about these topics. Excellent. How about uh, you, Tabitha? Why do you think arts and culture play such an important role in social change? Yeah, I agree with Erin. I, I mean, I think that art has the power to open dialogues in societies and to change aspects of culture. And it's something that people can really unite around. So, I mean, I try to imagine like the civil rights movement without freedom songs or um, the Black Panthers without Emory Douglas or Twitter um, or Black Lives Matter without Twitter. Um, I think a lot of those movements would have failed, but because they're so ingrained in the culture um, and in the history of that, that specific place and time, I think it just propels these movements and uh, different social justice things forward. Um, so I think that culture and art often are, are catalysts for change in that way. One can't imagine the abolitionist movement without uh, Frederick Douglass and North Star and Uncle Tom's Cabin for that matter. Um, I'll get back to you, Minerva, in a minute, but we have a question from Marsha. Our arts organization wishes to solicit suggestions for how to design art projects for children, projects geared to teaching tolerance, conflict resolution, and other proactive solutions to promote peace. Uh, let me suggest uh, that we shift again to Minerva uh, about children, because I can imagine it's been more challenging with children to teach them through art, tolerance, and conflict resolution. Any suggestions for Marcia? Hi, yeah, definitely. I think that it, it, it comes to um, where the parents should get involved and um, instead of shaming away from one's culture and artistic um, values that we should teach them. Um, it, they should, they, it should start at an early age and instead of them growing up and then trying to find who they are. So that would be my best suggestion. Certainly that makes sense. Um, we have another question. Who are some current artists, musicians, visual artists, or other forms that you find inspiring? I'm going to take this one as a question for all three of you. Uh, Aaron, let's start with you. Well, I think, you know, through the experience over the last few years of doing the, the boycott exhibit and the Humanize Not Militarize exhibit, I've really developed an appreciation for graphic art and for the role that, that political posters have played in all of these various movements that, you know, there has been a visual art component to so many different social justice movements and so I've begun to learn about some of these artists that have you know uh, developed th these great reputations um, for doing political art and graphic art and um, it's really interesting to me I think also as I mentioned before posters are um, so accessible 
you know, I mean, all art should be very accessible, but sometimes I think when we think about visual art, it seems like it's maybe a little removed from us at times, and, and um, posters and uh, mural arts, you know, these are all things that bring messages and, and beauty out to the masses, and, and so I really developed a great appreciation for that. Yes, you don't have to be Picasso to make a difference. Uh, Tabitha, what current artists, musicians, visual artists, or some other form of art are you finding inspiring these days? I think here in New Orleans, uh, Brandon B. Mike Odoms, he's like a, a street artist, um, so he'll paint on the side of buildings, um, and he's done some exhibits lately to um, kind of owed to the Angola Three and to the Black Panthers here in New Orleans. And I would say also just for people, young black people, I think Kendrick Lamar um, and his song, We Gonna Be Alright, I think that's um, been somewhat, of a, somewhat of an anthem for young black folks um, who are just getting involved in the social justice movement. Even I know who Kendrick Lamar is. I know that song, too. Uh, Minerva, are there any current artists who are inspiring you, whether they're musicians or visual artists or community artists? Yes, and actually that's who we actually look up for inspiration is the the own assets that the community has when it comes to um, musicians, visual arts. Um, we try to use what the community really has um, and we do consult with um, I guess more of an expert in certain areas but we try mostly to come for it to come out of the community use what they have. Yes, building on what works to help people create what they need is a hallmark of AFSC's work. Uh, we have another question. Have any of you three worked with museums as part of your organizing? What do you think the role of museums is in cultural organizing? Do you find them accessible? A lot in that question. And if not, what gets in the way? Um, uh, let's start with Erin on that one. Erin, have you had any experience working with museums? museums? Yes, we have had a lot of experience um, with several exhibits that we've organized for American Front and Service Committee. I think, um, you know, working with those larger type of institutions do, um, does give you a lot more access um, to various audiences, but it, there can be some barriers. You know, certainly we at AFSC try to make our work um, a part of community organizing, and so we love working with lots of different groups that might host one of our exhibits in their community and use that a way to build upon their own community organizing work. And so, you know, we create a lot of manuals and toolkits to help people not just bring the exhibit to their community and show it, but then to have conversations or film screening or panel discussion um, to really dig into these, these various issues that we're bringing up in our exhibits. Uh, museums can can do that, uh, and and they definitely have a lot more resources to do it. So I think that there's you know pros and cons to working with museums, and and uh, you know as I I think I alluded to, I think you know sometimes they're not always accessible for all people, and um, and so we certainly do want our message to be accessible to all. That's a very good point. Uh, Tabitha, how about museum work? Have you had any experience with museums or alternatively, what do you think the role of museums could be in cultural organizing? So we actually reached out to a few museums um, when we were looking for places to screen the Katrina X short doc initially, um, especially around the time of Katrina. And we found that it was really difficult for community organizations to do that simply because they wanted to plan things, you know, two years out and things in the community don't happen uh, as happen that way. They happen in, in specific moments in time. So um, it was it wasn't a possibility for us to do it at that time. Um, I think we could be open to doing it in the future, but I find that a lot of times we have more luck with cultural 
art type museum, so like the Ashe Cultural Art Center and black museums, things like that, are people that we're more able to work with in, in an easy way. Yes, uh, museums plan for years out, as you pointed out. And often the relationships or lack of relationships makes it hard to access those museums. Um, it, is, it is one of the many challenges but also exciting moments for cultural work to find ways in the doors of museums that are not traditionally expected to be organizing. Um, what about you? Any luck with museums in that area, in your region, or is it there yet? Um, well, one of the things that the Central Valley lacks is actually um, museums overall. We only, in Fresno, we have just a few, and we have been fortunate enough that we have been able to collaborate in, with them in using their spaces. Um, to have our cultural events, um, but definitely it is a challenge to find the space and and being able to plan ahead because if there's one, then everybody's trying to get access to it. But um, we have collaborated with them and we have used them as a as a space for our community events. I might also point out AFSC has been partnering with libraries in many parts of the country to present exhibits. Um, we have another question. When you are engaging in cultural organizing, how do you set goals for yourself? Uh, it's not as if your goal is passing a specific piece of legislation. So what does success look like to you? Erin, I'm going to ask you to take that one. Yeah, that can be really tricky um, because, you know, sometimes we are, our goal is to change the narrative on some of these issues and that can take years and years and it's sometimes difficult to measure. But um, we certainly, you know, do set goals for ourselves in terms of community organizations that we want to engage, that we want to work with, maybe, you know, new, new um, community groups that we haven't worked with before, um, or, you know, perhaps media mentions that we might want to get, stories, um, numbers of people through the door. I mean, those are some, you know, uh, some things that we can measure easily. But I do think that when you're doing cultural organizing work, um, there you you do have to think about the long-term goals a lot more about you know how um, how these issues might come up for somebody who has never engaged with talking about militarism before, and they saw this exhibit. You know, you don't know how that might have affected them in that moment. Um, we always, you know, just try to have follow-up events and you know um, keep track of some of the people who do consistently come to our events to see where they are. Good point. Um, how about you, Tabitha? When you're engaging in cultural organizing, how do you set goals? It's What does success look like since you're not trying to press for a specific piece of legislation, for example? Well, for us, a lot of times we actually couple cultural organizing with other forms of organizing forms of organizing. Um, so while it may not look like passing legislation, um, it might look like supporting certain bills and using certain cultural elements to gather people for that. So um, for instance, with the, the garden work, uh, a lot of people were like, why would you, why would you build a garden in Holly Grove? Black people don't eat vegetables. We're like, no, we can, we can develop that further. Um, so we can you know, pull people in and give away free vegetables and then teach them um, to change their, their culture, um, or rather to go back to it um, in terms of gardening and then maybe to pass a piece of legislation um, that turns over open lots or blighted property to us or to the community in order to make those um, more garden spaces or green spaces for other um, ecological purposes. Yes, we all can appreciate food, can't we? Um, Minerva, how about that? 
in your case, when you are engaging in, in this cultural organizing, how do you set goals? What does success look like after your experiences with Tamajavi? Well, with the communities that we work with, we know that it's on the long haul. So like Erin said, um, success and our goals might not be met immediately within a year or two. But um, success definitely looks like when um, our fellows, for example, despite finishing the fellowship program, that they continue organizing in their communities and that the information keeps on moving. Um, for example, one of our fellows, um, he was from indigenous communities in Mexico. He kept organizing his community through um, um, a yearly gathering in which they um, celebrated um, the the culture from their, his community. But it brought it brought people from all over the United States almost um, to be centralized here in the Central Valley. So that's what success looks like for us. That's wonderful. After all, each one teach one is a long-term adage in the African American community. Uh, we have another question. What are some of the roadblocks or challenges of getting the communities you work with to be involved in this work? Uh, Tabitha, I want to start with you on that since you have more challenges than many given New Orleans' physical situation. Yeah, so getting communities to get involved with us. Um, I think you have to be strategic about where you establish yourself. So for us, we went to the Holly Grove community, and we have a piece-by-piece -piece house there. So we're working specifically, so we'll go knock on people's doors and things like that. But um, the challenges are definitely that when we're talking about poor black communities, a lot of times people are working two, three, four jobs. And so they may not be home and we might not have access to them. But there's also a flip side to that because that might also mean that their kids are home alone and they might need to send them to someone to get organized. So um, there's always a, a disadvantage, but there's always an advantage too. Uh, very good point. Um, Aaron, uh, what are some of the roadblocks or challenges of getting communities you work with to be involved in your experience? Your experience. Yeah, I think a lot of what Tabitha mentioned are, are things that, you know, we're all struggling with in, in social change work. Um, I think, you know, here in Indiana, we have a very unique government here. <laughs> we have a lot of challenges. There's a lot of issues that people are facing um, in education and health care and, and, you know, low wages. So we're competing with a lot of things. I think you know when we're talking about peace and justice issues, you know, making it um, personal for people to connect to. I think that's that's what keeps people engaged is their own you know personal investment in working to um, to build peace in their own lives and in the communities around them. But there are so many challenges. There are so many injustices. It's um, you know sometimes hard to know where to put your energy and your time. Those are very valuable resources that we all have. So uh, so I think that's that's a constant struggle of of just keeping people in engaged and 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 helping people to not feel so burnt out on you know all of the various injustices of the day. Injustices of the day. That's interesting because one of the more interesting approaches that AFSC has for this work is to start from where people are. So in our experience, we listen to what the community says it needs, no matter what that may be. Uh, in the case of, let's say, New Orleans, did you start by listening to young people asking for everything from better schools to a plot of land to grow or a fashion show. What did you hear them tell you about what they wanted, what they needed? So when I, I came into things, um, they were already kind of getting started. The fashion show and the parade were things that the young people had been doing for two or three years before I, I even got here. Um, but they seemed to, to really enjoy it. So we're like, well, if you want to do it, then you put it together. Um, and so that's what's happened. 
Um, they've showed how much they liked it by putting things together and we just give them the resources that they need. So really letting the young people um, have agency and lead the work and just following up with the resources or maybe the education or things like that um, that they might need to push things a little bit further. Excellent. Um, Minerva, did you have specific requests from the communities, especially since you work with so many different communities? What did people say they wanted from you or from AFSC? I think that the, the, um, a place, a place where they could gather and come and share, like I said, Alex said, share their cultures, their tradition, but also share their concerns. I think that the Central Valley also brings challenges in that the communities that we work with sometimes are apprehensive of coming together at times because of histories of colonization, oppression, but once the, once the um, space is open for them, they um, are more than willing to come and share. Um, That's an excellent point. Erin, how about you? What did people tell you they wanted when you first started working with either the Boycott Exhibit or Humanize Not Militarize, or for that matter, when you first got to AFSC? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I'll speak to the boycott exhibit. I think, um, you know, it's really been a wonderful resource for particularly student organizers who are working in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that, you know, they've been able to have this exhibit that, you know, shows this history of, of an, a nonviolent tactic, just one tactic in, in an overall movement. And um, to really, you know, have conversations about the role of economic activism. So I think oftentimes a lot of the things that uh, these projects that I worked on in my 13 years at AFSC have been um, really great tools and resources for communities to to use to um, to just open up these conversations, to uh, you know, dig deeper into them and. Um, engage others in the conversation. So, um, so sometimes, you know, we are responding. You know, in, in the case of the Eyes Wide Open exhibit that uh, was uh, came out during the Iraq War, that was an, a memorial to all of the soldiers uh, who had been killed in the Iraq War. And we also featured a collection of shoes that represented um, just a portion of the Iraqi civilians. And that was so necessary at that point in time because people, there was a war raging, but people were very removed from it. We um, were, images of, of flag draped coffins were banned from television. Uh, so people were really unaware of what the human cost of war was. And so we saw that that was something that you know, we needed to almost bring the war home for people so that they could understand what uh, was really at stake in that war. And so that, that is, uh, I think that was, that's one example of how we responded to what society needed in order to have conversations about peace. Uh, one follow-up on that. You mentioned uh, toolkits and resources. Would you tell us where we could look for some of these toolkits and resources? Certainly. You can find toolkits and resources at afsc.org. Uh, for our, our Humanize, Not Militarize exhibit we, and film festival, we have a great website, humanize.afsc.org. And we've got uh, a curriculum up there that we created for uh, youth, um, mostly high school, college age youth, uh, to um, start to think about issues of safety and security in their communities and, and talking about um, militarism and policing. And uh, that's a curriculum that I'm currently using in an after school program here in Indianapolis. Excellent. Excellent. One more question, this one for Tabitha. You recently wrote a blog post for AFSC.org where you talked about colonialization, the residue it leaves, and what emerges in the cultural aftermath. Can you talk a little bit more about that and share what you wrote about? Sure. Um, so in the colonization process, um, what you, the things you have to take away are the things that actually make 
a community, so language, culture, sometimes land. Um, and so in order to build that back up or to, to remember those things, um, you have to, to sometimes pull it out of people or tease it out. It's never gone. The remnants are always there, but they're covered by whatever the new colonization is. So in, in this case, in New Orleans, that would be um, white supremacy. And the way that white supremacy looks means that post-Katrina, um, there have been several ordinance or attempts to pass ordinances that don't allow people to have um, brass bands parading through the streets or practicing anymore, which is something um, that's nearly intrinsic to the Treme community. So uh, people have taken to the streets. The way to, to undo those things is to just to occupy the space. So people are going out and they're having the second lines and they're doing things like that um, in order to say that you can't, you can't oppress us in this way. Um, so there are little ways to, to undo it and by having these, these different things like um, music and culture um, to undo small remnants of colonization when so many people across the communities are doing the same thing it has a greater impact to um, to kind of reorganize the the system into something that's more culturally relevant and less oppressive. Great. Uh, we have a question. Um, people want to know what kinds of conversations do all three of you have with people who encounter issues of militarism, et cetera, for the first time via the artwork? Uh, Aaron, I'm going to start with you on that one. What do people say when they encounter these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the best examples I could give would be from the experience of doing the Eyes Wide Open exhibit. Um, you know, it might not be really perceived as being an art exhibit, but it was oftentimes described as a public art exhibit because you know, it was boots and shoes on the ground and we would display it in places where people might not expect to see that, you know, in, in public parks or in front of government buildings, um, you know, the National Mall in Washington, D.C. But um, I think, you know, through that experience, especially because we were showing this exhibit during the time of war when, you know, most people in this country were for the Iraq War at that time, and you know they're confronted with this reality of what the human cost of war was. You know sometimes we would and be engaging with military families who had lost their son or daughter, and were not expecting to happen upon a pair of boots that may have their name of their child on them. Um, and you know that was always a delicate thing for us, and we you know tried to handle things in the most respectful way that we could. But it was really surprising to me sometimes how people would, you know, just, <laughs> of course, have an emotional reaction to the exhibit, but then really start to process the idea of, of you know, us as a Quaker organization and, you know, being pacifist and wanting there to be another way that, you know, perhaps war is not always the answer and that there, you know, could have been other ways to solve this conflict. So, you know, the conversations that we had in that space were, you know, sometimes very surprising uh, and, um, and really life-altering, not just for some of the people that came to the exhibit, but I think also for some of the volunteers that worked at that exhibit and, and were having those conversations with people. That's a very powerful statement. Uh, it admits that we're not just organizers, we are also human beings all together in this. Um, let me ask Minerva a question about why art plays such an important role in act, cultural change and activism. We see art um, and culture as an important part of social change because cultural work is more than a strategy for organizing. Ultimately, it's a human right that um, 
challenges the histories of invisibility, oppression, marginalization, and inequality. Um, and it's through the cultural organizing that the communities are able to claim their rights and identities. Um, also, arts and culture have the power of bringing to people together because it's something that they are they, they can connect easily to, um, not only within their communities, but to the communities, the other immigrant communities. Um, and lastly, um, we see it as a catalyst for moving forward so that these um, immigrant communities could be participating um, in the public life. Wow, that's a powerful statement about the value of this work. Um, Tabitha, I'm going to ask you a question uh, that we often all gotten, those organizations and groups that currently don't have a cultural organizing component but would like to add one, uh, what would be your recommendation about how to get started on adding cultural organizing or integrating it into your current program? I think first you have to assess who you're working with, so really get to know your population and find out what they like and what they dislike, um, what historic things have been a part of the community, and then um, allowing them to add that in as possible because you never want to force uh, cultural organizing into any sort of organizing work that you're doing. Um, don't we would never say, oh, well, we're just going to have a brass band at this, uh, this protest because it would make it a second line. It'll be great because we know that there's a history tied to that, um, and it's really important for the people you're working with to make you aware of the history and to, for you as an organizer to incorporate that into your work. Indeed. Uh, Minerva, how about you? Uh, what would you recommend people do if they want to incorporate cultural organizing? Well, I definitely agree with Tavita. I think that we need to look into the communities that we're working with, and it should not be something that we should be forced, right? For Pan Valley, cultural organizing um, um, became part of a strategy, but it was something that came from listening over and over the stories of cultural discrimination um, and the lack of spaces for it. So we could say that the it came out organically. It was enforced and it goes really well with the communities that we work with. Well, that's a very encouraging because people focus on the barriers of communication, uh, very often lines of language or dialect or race or ethnicity as an excuse not to recognize our common humanity, which is something AFSC has baked in its DNA. Um, let's talk quickly about how people can learn more about the work you all are doing in your communities. Erin? Uh, sure, well, you know, on the AFSC website you can find information about the Humanize Not Militarize exhibit and film festival, also the boycott exhibit. We uh, have extended the deadline for our Humanize Not Militarize youth film festival to April 20th. So if you check our website, you should be seeing some video submissions soon, and we will announce the official selections for this year's film festival and are planning a gathering of the youth that work on those videos to Washington, D.C. for the summer. So stay tuned to our Facebook page. Also, um, you can find us at Humanize Not Militarize on Facebook and our website. That's great. Um, glad that we're using all the different tools, social media, live streaming conversations and things like that to stay in touch. Uh, Tabitha, how can people learn more about Peace by Peace and specifically about the work in New Orleans? Sure, you can find information about Peace by Peace at um, Peace by Peace, that's P-E-A-C-E by P-I-E-C-E, um, that works. There's also information on the AFSC site um, and of course, since we're working with young people, we have um, a Facebook account, um, Peace by Peace New Orleans, we have a Twitter account, and we also have Instagram, so you can find us in all those ways. Minerva, how about you? How can people find out more about Tamajavi and the overall work of the Pan Valley Institute? 
Well, definitely on the AFSC um, website, we uh, we have a section there for Pan Valley Institute, but we also have our website, which is tamijavi.org, and you can find information about the Tamijavi Festival and the Tamijavi Cultural Organizing Fellowship Program as well. And we have Facebook, um, you can find us under PVI Tamijavi, and on Twitter as Tamijavi. Okay, uh, one last question for the th for all three of you. In your experience, despite the challenges and roadblocks, what is the most gratifying aspect of cultural organizing? What makes you happy to do this work? Or to be selfish, what do you get out of it? I'm going to start with uh, Aaron on that one. Uh, sure, I would say, I mean, mostly in my experience, it's been working with young people, working on college campuses and with high school students as gives me a lot of energy. And I love uh, working on any project with young people. And, and most of the ones that I've had the privilege of working on have engaged with youth. So I, I would say that's what, uh, what I enjoy most. OK, great. Tabitha, um, can you tell us what you get out of this work, despite all the challenges and things that we've already discussed? Sure. Um, for me, it means I get to be myself. I'm always really comfortable because I'm working with people who are not that much younger than me um, and are interested in a lot of the same cultural elements. Um, so that's always a plus for me. Sometimes it also means a, a good fish plate on the side. Okay, glad to hear. Glad to hear that, uh, Minerva. How about you? What do you get out of the work, the challenges, despite all of that? For me personally, I think that um, it has been a learning process. Um, coming from a very small community, I have been able to learn about all the different communities that we have here in the Central Valley, um, their values, their culture. Um, and like Tabitha says, once in a while we get to eat delicious food and listen to great music. Um, for Pan Valley, I think um, it's been great to be able to validate um, this community's um, histories and journeys and contributions that they make to this country. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, that's all we have time for now. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to learn more about AFSC and programs like Peace by Peace, the Pan Valley Institute, and Humanize Not Militarize, visit our website, afsc.org. Thank you. This has been Cultural Organizing, Art as a Tool for Social Change, a production of the American Friends Service Committee.